Hello and welcome to Chain Reaction, a podcast series examining America's role in the world. I am your host, Aaron Stein, the Director of Research at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. Every two weeks, we will talk to experts about a variety of topics and why they matter for U.S. foreign policy. On this episode of FBRI's Chain Reaction, I speak with Rob Lee again, as we spoke last week, and Michael Kaufman, as I spoke to a couple weeks ago, about the latest in Ukraine. For listeners, we recorded this podcast on Friday, February 18th at about 10.20 a.m., so you can backdate it, any of the discussion we have till about that point in time. As the situation continues to develop, we'll continue to have podcasts. Thanks for listening. Hello and welcome. Uh, we're doing a second follow-up podcast to the podcast we did last week uh, with Rob Lee, who has joined us again, uh, who is a senior fellow at FPRI. Uh, and joining us along with Rob is uh, Michael Coffin. Mike, if people listen to the show, will know was on a couple weeks ago. And for those who don't know already, Mike is the director of the Russia Studies Program at CNA. We are doing another podcast out of sequence because events in Ukraine continue to move very quickly, uh, with a lot of people predicting that conflict between the two sides, Ukraine and Russia, could break out at any moment. So to discuss the latest, uh, I decided to have both of you on. And let's just start right there. Um, Mike, perhaps I'll go to you first. Give us a quick snapshot of what's going on. And then, Rob, I'll come to you with it with any follow up. OK, well, the I think the reality looking at today on this Friday is that we have very large uh, grouping of Russian forces in Belarus, around Ukraine, in Russia, and in Crimea. Regular forces, probably over 150,000, most likely over 110 battalion tactical groups. A tremendous amount of fixed wing aviation has been moved into the area and rotary wing aviation as well, attack helicopters, transport helicopters and the like. They have deployed the forward staging areas and even from them forward to the border, right, in field camps. So you have a lot of Russian forces today that are on the Ukrainian border with support, logistics, enable enablers, artillery, a lot of army and district level gear as well. What we kind of see is like um, whether it's high power artillery, communications, logistics components, field hospitals, forward deployed, you know, all those indicators that you see of a, of a force clearly positioned for a large scale military operation. There is no evidence of a Russian withdrawal. There's some showpiece troop rotations, what I call kind of the troop deployment, redeployment shell game that they've played in order to create a narrative this week. But there is no uh, drawdown of Russian forces. Instead, we've seen an increase of Russian military presence over the course of this week. All the indicators point to the fact that there's going to be a very large war, that the <laughs> Russian military is positioned for a very large operation against Ukraine. And most recently, we have this tremendous escalation of shelling and exchanges along the line of contact in the Donbass. We have statements by Denar, Eleanor, the separatist for public leadership, that they are evacuating civilians in preparation or advance of what they believe will be an imminent Ukraine attack. That tells us that the pretext is being formed right now for Russian military intervention. And the momentum is really picked up on the Russian media as well, carrying these stories, essentially rapidly building the case for what is going to very likely be a uh, Russian use of force, right? So, so we've seen the media environment dramatically shift in the last couple of days, telling us that there's, that there's a pretext in the making for what we've long argued, I know Rob has, I have too, right, including on, on your podcast, that Russia is going to, uh, it's going it's going to do this. There is going to be a war. Rob, why don't you pick up right there? Maybe, you know, take us up right to the moment just for listeners, because obviously this podcast will come out a little bit later. We're recording this on Friday, February 18th. It's about 1020 in the morning. So just uh, East Coast time for, for just give us the latest. Sure. So, I mean, just, just piggyback off what Mike said. So if, if, if we say 110 BDGs, that's two thirds of the Russian military is total, right? And so BDGs are formed from tank, motorized rifle, naval infantry, VDV airborne forces units. That's, it, it's a decent metric for Russia's ground combat power because these, these are units that are only contract soldiers so they can be deployed overseas using combat, no conscripts. Um, and so anytime you see a troop figure, it includes conscripts. It's always something, you know, it's, it doesn't tell you that much. So we're talking about the permanent readiest units of the Russian military. These are, you know, a, 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 we're at two thirds. We're going to maybe 70 percent are going to be taking part in, in this what's happening right now. Um, and then if you add in VDV units, you know, there, there's there are photos of um, some of the airborne armor vehicles from the 51st uh, Airborne Regiment in Tula. They're, ro- they're, they're rigged for parachutes. If those battalions are not in the border, but can be taken, you know, before from the VDV, you might add in a, in a three or four, you know, whatever BDGs, right? So we're talking about a, a, a massive force and a substantial share of Russia's ground combat power. And the things that aren't included in that in those numbers, the BDGs, 
are things like district and, and army level assets, right? Which you never attach to a battalion. Well, those things are there too, right? They've massed the Skanderim um, brigades and battalions. They've moved them to Belarus. They've moved them elsewhere. The, it, there's evidence they've moved them close to the border, and they're coming with missiles. They're coming with all these long combat uh, trailers, which means they're coming with, you know, with, with ammunition. Um, you know, they, they deployed Roskvardia a couple weeks ago. There are a couple reasons why you, this is the Russian National Guard. A couple reasons why you might do that. None of them are, are particularly good, uh, right? And they all kind of point in the wrong direction. Um, that's also something unique, and, and it wasn't really what Wall explains. Um, right now, Russia has arguably the, I think, I think the largest naval grouping in the Black Sea they've had since, since basically the end of the, the Soviet Union, largest amphibious capability since then, too. If they want to, Russia has the capability of, of conducting a, you know, probably brigade-reinforced amphibious landing with, the, the, I think, 12 or 13 large landing ships plus all these uh, landing crafts, some of which they've also moved. Um, there are reports that the Caspian flotilla is supposed to send more of their ships across, and some of some of their corvettes and small missile ships have have caliber cruise missiles, so it's you know it's quite potent. And there are reports that the Northern Fleet, which has uh, the Marshal Stinov cruiser, Admiral Kostanov frigate, and, and some other ships that are in the Mediterranean right now, those may also join enter the Black Sea. So that's I mean it's reporting, but it's, it's not 100 percent clear yet. But that may happen over the next few days. So the naval component is is unprecedented in in you know post Soviet Russia. The ground combat, you know, component is unprecedented. And then we've seen this huge aviation deployment. That, that's been more recent. But, you know, we, we, you know on, on satellite photos, we're seeing a number of squadrons of Su-25 attack, short-range kind of attack aircraft, kind of like an A-10, um, all around Ukraine right now. We've seen, you know, I think there are three squadrons in, in one of the airbases in, in Belarus and in a variety of other places. And then, you know, Mike was saying, a bunch of helicopter squadrons are, are occupying staging areas. And, and you look at the videos of this stuff, it, you know, it, the posture is something that you use for a week or two. You would not do this for more than a few weeks. Right. And, and, and the, the alert status they're at is the same thing. The ground units that they, 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 they move from the big assembly areas in Poganova and Voronezh and Yonia and Smolensk. They've moved those close to the border in Bryansk, Kursk and, and, and Belgorod. And, the, you know, these are things that are 10, 20 miles from the border and basically you know, right now, right now for the soldiers, it's not, you know, very comfortable, right? Because the more administrative you are uh, status for a unit, the more you, 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 can, you can sustain it for a long time. The less administrative, the less, you know, amount of time you can sustain it for. A lot of this equipment, the helicopters are just out in the open, right? And kind of, you know, not great terrain. You do that if you're if you're planning to do an operation, um, but, you, but you're not going to keep that, that kind of posture for, you know, multiple weeks, basically. It's, it's you know, it's going to be pretty, pretty brief. And so it, it's been clear for really the last week or two that, okay, we're in a window where something could happen and they basically have to, you know, do something now or else they have to kind of pull back on that posture. Right. So they're at a point right now where they could, they could conduct a significant military operation on hours notice, right? Before that it was a day's notice. And so that's the kind of you know thing we've been looking for is all right, what will they pull back? Mike mentioned, you know, that the units that are, that are allegedly being moved. Well, even the ones they're talking about, the ones in Crimea, um, to me, those are the least concerning. The most concerning units right now is the it's the it's the buildup near Kursk, Bulgarod, Bryansk, because that all those uh, um, areas are they're close to Kiev, right? And there's a huge force there, and there isn't really much evidence any of that stuff is moving. There's a, you know the Russians said uh, the MOD said they were, but it's not clear that any of that kind of stuff is moving away. So um, the situation is you know it's very dangerous, and then obviously you've seen the escalation in rhetoric and and you know um, you know potential pretexts in in the Donbas right now. You know, none of which is surprising, and some of which, you know, the the, the reporting from the U.S. intelligence community indicated this is kind of stuff that, that they're, they're expecting. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, what's I think what's really concerning is that this, you know, there are two buildups that happened this year. Right, There's one the spring, one that you know began again in the fall. The continuation, so so it's it's you know it's something to, to think about as as one kind of thing, but maybe it'll separate iterations. But you know, since the in early early fall, and sorry, I should say I don't have a clearance, so I don't have any classified information or anything like that. But even from just public source, you know, reporting, you know, we know that CIA Director Bill Burns went to Moscow on November third, a very abnormal kind of event. Um, and it was clear there was a big concern that early November that something was going on that Russia was doing that the U.S. intelligence community could see and was very concerned about. And right. so, you know, we we've known this has been a problem since then. The U.S. intelligence community has been quite ahead of saying, you know, the the public reporting saying that the 100 BDG figure was given out in like early December, late November, and right. you know they've reached that and they've surpassed it, right? And so a lot of those things the U.S. intelligence community is saying this is what we're seeing is going to happen 
it's happened, right? And and they had high confidence in a lot of this. And you know, unfortunately, the the facts kind of bear out a lot of what they were predicting. Well, Mike, let me come to you. You know, throughout this, basically, you know, since let's just date it to Thanksgiving, just for a frame of reference. To, to follow along here, even though it dates back farther than that, there's been a discrepancy between how like the Ukrainian side has described potential Russian intentions versus the U.S. As we're sort of, I think we're all in agreement here that we're in the final days here before the Russians uh, begin to move. Have you seen any evidence on the Ukrainian side that they're actually starting to grapple with what's going to happen? You know, are they moving to try and stop this or, or do they have something else in mind basically to deal with what we all expect to be a very large Russian invasion? That's a good question. I would say that there are actually differences within Ukraine as well between um, what the political leadership was saying and what the military intelligence leadership was doing. So Ukraine got sort of stuck uh, the way the story was developing because uh, if they had acknowledged the looming threat of Russian invasion, it would create tremendous economic pressure on Ukraine, investment would have fled, uh, and they were trying to prevent panic for the public. That also then meant that the political leadership couldn't really mobilize the military because the public can observe military mobilization for war for defense, right? And so you can't you can't kind of uh, have the schizophrenic policy. So they were trying to prepare for it, raise readiness levels in their units. Uh, I think Ukrainian intelligence knew understood very well what the real situation was, although they were downplaying it for a very long time. They were downplaying it both because of of their perception that it would have it would lead to tremendous pressure on the Ukrainian economy and instability that could destabilize the political system before any invasion was conducted. They're also downplaying it for political reasons because they felt pressure from the United States and Europeans to compromise. And I gotta tell you, there are a lot of views in Ukraine that are very conspiratorial. They believe that the United States was hyping the war threat in order to pressure Kiev to change its position on Minsk, which I know sounds a little ridiculous coming here from Washington, DC. But in Ukraine, there are quite a few folks that genuinely believe this, that we were exaggerating the threat. And some people have accused, you know, people like myself, which were prominent voices in the conversation for needlessly stirring up the threat of a Russian military operation uh, when, when all the facts and indicators were there. The other thing I'll tell you is that in the past week, you've clearly seen the Ukrainian military prepare for a Russian attack, right? But the, many of these developments I, I think have taken place very late in the game, very late in the game. But these are preparation. They are doing now things that they should have frankly been doing too, in my view. And the political leadership, well, the truth is that they consistently had a different interpretation of the facts. They agreed, I think, with the United States on the military situation, but they believe that Russia's goal was long-term coercion and to strangle the Ukrainian economy to place pressure on them. They consistently believe that somehow Ukraine is magically too big to be invaded, too hard to be invaded, and that Russia wouldn't do it, that the costs were too high, even as people were telling them consistently that they were wrong. And to this day, uh, very senior people in Ukrainian political circles hold to the proposition that this is all a very realistic course of bluff. And I had, you know, probably been making the dark joke that, you know, they, they began to look like the administration from the movie Don't Look Up, because that's how they were frankly sounding in, in terms of situation. As 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 uh, everything pointed to uh, the likelihood of a, a Russian military invasion. So these are kind of the nuanced differences. The military, I think, has been preparing. The intelligence services in Ukraine have seen the situation for some time out and have also been preparing. The political leadership had a different interpretation, and they also were stuck because they they really feared acknowledging the situation to create public panic and and immense levels of economic pressure on, on, on Ukraine itself that they were worried they wouldn't be able to withstand. Well, you know, we've also, I think the U.S. intelligence community and perhaps informed by the experiences of 2004 and perhaps even going back to 2008, both with Georgia and with um, you know, the previous um, uh, invasions of Ukraine in 2014, have been out in front of this. Rob, can you talk a little bit about, I guess, in the last 24 hours, there's been a uptick in the amount of shelling along the line of contact, at least to me, who doesn't follow this at the level of granularity um, that both of you do. And many people are interpreting it as sort of like creating the pretext for creating the legal justification to begin the invasion itself. Can you talk about the, like the situation on that line of contact and perhaps how the Ukrainians have been responding to it um, in the face of what many expect to be um, you know, sort of the prelude to the larger invasion? Yeah, I mean, I, I so I don't follow a lot of contact stuff too much. The, the the thing that was clear was that I think yesterday, you know, a, a few different sources recorded the highest number of you know the, the highest mass shelling in years. So I think I think 
I know the OSC kind of pulled out some of their people. I'm not, I think they still recorded, a, you know, quite a number of, of um, explosions. So the Ukrainians, um, you know, clearly there was, it was a, a significant uptick. And then there were, you know, there are photos kind of spread of, I think it was kindergarten that was allegedly hit by, by artillery rounds. Um, it, it, I, you know, sit, sitting back here, it's, it's always hard to kind of tell exactly what's happening. Um, you know, one thing that's notable is that on the Russian side, so they, there's a number of kind of war correspondents they have um, who, who, you know, covered the fighting in, in Idlib very closely in 2020. Some of them went to Nagorno Karabakh to cover that. And a lot of them, you know, started kind of with the coverage in, in the Donbass in 2014-2015. Um, they're all now in Donbass. Right? They, they've, they, they've come back in, in force, which is kind of a, you know, not great sign that they, if they think there's a reason to be there. And of course, you know, you're, you're going to see you're, you're going to see a certain line from them. And so that's already happening. But, you know, the, the, I think the preparation here has been going on for a little bit. Obviously, Russia's denied this for, for a while. But you know, at the same time, they, they have a massive force. They never really explained what it was doing there. Um, you know, Shoigu, when he spoke to Putin um, well, last week, a few days ago, he mentioned this, you know, huge exercise was involving every every military district. And it's like, OK, well, it's been obviously been going on for months. And yet you didn't mention it until now. I wonder why that was. Um, but, you know, th there's a lot of stuff that they, they haven't been explaining. And they're talking before about the Allied Resolve uh, exercise in, in Belarus. And of course, during that entire phase of movement to Belarus, we were seeing units from, you know, the Northern Fleet moving to Kursk. And it's like, well, that, you know, has nothing to do with this. And yet, um, you know, there's no, they, they weren't providing a good explanation. It was clearly using that exercise as cover to, to move other things around. And so, you know, it, it's just, it has been a very concerning situation for, for a while now. And, and, you know, one thing I heard um, <clears throat> when, when I wrote my article and Mike or it as well, you know, predicting that there was a good chance it was going to kick off. Um, my, I think my confidence was probably lower than Mike's. But, you know, one, one of the things that the response from some people was that they hadn't seen this heavy kind of PR campaign to justify a conflict. And my, my disagreement with that was the only thing Russian news, when they cover Ukraine in the last seven years, it's been consistent with what they've been covering, right? It's consistent how they portray what happens in Donbass, how they portray Kiev, how they portray, you know, you know, Ukraine being run by fascists and nationalists and so on. And so, you know, people are saying, oh, they needed this new campaign to kind of justify or sell war. It's like, well, you know, that, that's been going on for seven years. And the most recent Lovato poll about this showed that, you know, almost, I think 50% of Russians blame, I think, NATO for, for the, the tensions in Ukraine. They think another 16% blame Kiev. Only 4% blame Russia. And so you can look at those polls and already say, you know, basically Russia's leadership has, you know, a, a, a significant degree, I think, of, of carte blanche to do things in Ukraine because most Russians, you know, feel similar to, the, to them about what's going on there. They're not happy with it and they don't, they don't blame themselves for this. And so a lot of people are saying, OK, I, I don't know if Putin has the domestic approval to do this. And my view has been basically maybe there's a restraint if, if the Russian military starts killing civilians or just destroying these really famous cities that have a huge role in Russian history. But in terms of you know, targeting the Ukrainian military, I never thought that would be a significant um, you know, domestic approval issue for, for Putin if the Russian military did that. And you know, I, I'm not surprised we're seeing it now, but you know, ultimately, you know, the last you know few years, we you know, I think the, the consistent line has been pushed, and um, I, you know, it's pretty clear how Russians feel about the situation, and so they don't they don't need that much more you know I think pretext to say okay we 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 we're okay with this happening at a minimum either supportive or even indifferent, but either way, you know, I, I don't think domestic approval is that big of a deal on this one, so it's you know it's it's certainly a concern. Very much agree with Rob. The information environment was already pre-cooked. The overwhelming majority of people in Russia uh, were going to believe that any any uh, proximate cause of conflict would be the fault of Ukraine and NATO. Um, second, in talking to a lot of Russian colleagues, you know, I was in Moscow in December, and a lot of people there were really didn't know what was going on, and they didn't see us coming. But in in terms of general orientation, you know, asking Russian colleagues, okay, let's say let's say this thing that you think isn't going to happen, the Russian invasion of Ukraine does happen, right? What is your reaction? Because Rus Russians, Russians up until probably today didn't think that, that this was for real either. They said, well, disagree with the political decision, but I'm going to support our troops, right? If Russian troops are in the fight with Ukrainian forces, they're going to back them. Which, by the way, is not dissimilar to, you know, my view on the, during the Iraq war. I thought Iraq war was the dumbest thing the United States did in the last 20 years, but once you know, your forces are in a dumb war. You have to, you, know, you support your troops and you do and you do the best you can uh, to help your country. So looking at the, the prospect of a war in Ukraine, 
You know, there's a there's a Russian saying that like Alex here are not familiar with, which is "ужасный конец лучше чем ужас без конца." It's better to have horrible, terrifying ending than to live with this kind of horror without end, right? That is the the mentality and perception of a number of elites there that, in some respects, they're going to make peace with the fact that the political leadership that Putin has chosen to do this, rather than to live with the continuity of this no war, no peace with Ukraine. And and the only challenges and problems for for Russia and for Russian European security resultant from what I think are fundamentally their policy mistakes in Ukraine, the, the failure of their policy post 2015. Uh, th- these are the only things I would add, just to kind of color a little bit with the Russian perspective, how Russians look at us, because many of them have been they've been just as much in denial as Ukrainians have been about the likelihood of this. They were actually on the same page. Ukrainians and Russians both were saying right. they don't true. think this is that this is going to happen. And and now around the same time, they're both coming out to the realization that they're wrong, that it very much looks like it's going to happen. And that's why I reached out to a number of Russian colleagues saying, OK, I don't expect you to concede the point to people like me as to, as to what your intentions were. But let's say this war does happen. What's your reaction? What's the reaction of the general kind of Russian elite in, in these different policy circles in Moscow? And, and the answer is they're going to be terribly disappointed, but they're going to support, you know, support uh, their government and their forces in the fight. I want to ask sort of a tangential question before I come back to what you two expect this will look like, i.e. the invasion routes and all those things. But the the thing that I wanted to come at you, which is like the open source intelligence sort of community online, I think it's, it's fair to say that a lot of what we know as outsiders, you know, perhaps even in discussions with people in the administration or in the U.S. government, is also informed by what we're seeing through the videos that Russians themselves post on, say, things like TikTok, then obviously the proliferation of satellite imagery. I'm also wary of how the Russians could manipulate that for their own treasure propaganda efforts. You know, it's one of the things that I'm interested in tangentially in terms of how, like, a country like Turkey uses drones. Rob, I know you follow this open source thing at granular detail, you know, how have the Russians at least maybe tried to tamper it or sought to use it to increase either ambiguity about their intentions? Um, and how is it factored into our understanding of their policies? You know, I guess that's sort of a long winded question, but like, how is this played out going sure. forward? So, you know, I, I noted this is, it was a video a week ago where it was, a, it, was, it was a bunch of first tank army, you know, tanks, air defense equipment, artillery, it was at the train station in, I think it was in Belgrade. So, so it was, this, it was equipment that had been at Poganova in Verona for a long time, the big assembly area, and then it had been moved to, to Belgrade to these kind of staging areas, right? This really concerning thing we started we started hearing about. I remember seeing this video, and it was it was you know there were a bunch of soldiers there, but the soldiers were making no attempt at preventing people from seeing what's going on, All right? So there's a road right there; they could have blocked off the road. And the people bring their kids, right? They're, they're, they're taking videos. They're making no attempt at kind of preventing that. And so yeah, I, I thought that was a bit odd. Um, they're always their explanations. Is it could always be soldiers not doing their jobs, or it could be they don't care. You know, I, I think part of it is if you if you assemble an invasion force, right? You can't hide that, right? No, no matter, especially you know, we, we compare 2014 to now. One of the really important things we noted is that the Ukrainian military is much more effective now than it was then. Right. And that means the Russian military had to deploy a much larger share of its military to in order to do you know these different kind of military options because they needed a bigger share of their force. And so in some ways, there was no way Russia could hide this completely. And so I think what they were they focused on, you know, in the beginning, part of this was about compellents, I think. And my view is that um, I, th- I think basically Russia, they, they, they tried negotiations with Ukraine. They got sick of it. And by, by 2021, they said, you know what? There's no no more, no more reason to negotiate with Zelensky, anyone in Ukraine. They're not going to move forward. The, the domestic politics you know, suggests they can't implement Minsk. So we're going to go another way. And so basically, the, the, the focus became, we're going to try and compel the U.S. or NATO, you know, Normandy for, format members, Germany and France. We're going to try and compel them to force Kiev to make these concessions. And so I, th- I th- really think... The, the build-up in the fall has been basically this last attempt where Russia was kind of signaling to the U.S. saying, you need to come in and 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 tell Zelensky that he needs to make these changes and that you will pull support, or it'll be war, right? We're giving you two options. Either Minsk agreement gets implemented you know, and, and some, maybe some other kind of political orientation changes or war, right? And, and that's that's been the kind of offing the whole time. And, you know, when you look at the initial build-up in the spring, I, I thought it was about deterrence, this time about compellence clear that, you know, it became more significant this time. And I think, you know, when I think when Putin talked to Biden in December, before the demands came out, I think that was the kind of last, the last good opportunity where he basically said, this is the last warning, 
if you don't make these concessions, we're going to go forward with the military option. That'd be a last kind of resort. And so some of the buildup supported that, right? It, it showed the forces being deployed. It was unmistakable what was going on. When you look at OSINT, it, it tells you the big picture, right? But it will not get a lot of details. And so one of the things that is important is that, you know, it, 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 it's subject to deception efforts. I think for the most part, Russia didn't mind too much a lot of the buildup th- that those things were being seen. Clearly, there's other things that are not being seen that I didn't see, right? You know, and, and sometimes you get reporting about, you know, intelligence community saying that Russia moved blood ahead, you know, to, and was pre-staging that. Obviously, you can't see that from public sources. But you can see the big tanks, you see the big equipment, you can't hide that. The, the issue, I think, was that Russia would basically said, right, you know, we can't hide those things, but you can still achieve tactical surprise before you escalate. Um, but either way, it was still about compellence. And I think still up until, you know, the, the end here, it was still about we, here are demands. If you want to, you know, give in and make unilateral concessions, OK, otherwise we're going to use military force and we're going to we're going to assemble such a large force that doesn't really matter. You know, even if we don't achieve strategic surprise, we've got such a large force, you can't do much about it. So I, I think there's been an element of both of those things. I think a couple of important things to know is that a lot of the you know, open source community of, of, of people, a lot of this come about because of Russia's wars, right? So the Donbass was maybe the first one where a lot of this came about. Syria has been a, a key one where people have been tracking things. And so people are much more, and not me, because I don't know how to geolocate things to do, you know, that kind of stuff. But there are a lot of people really capable at, at looking at videos, geolocating them, determining when they happen, so on. It's, re- it's quite impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, you know, OSINT stuff was useful for much of the buildup. Now it's, it's less useful just because... You know, the last few steps, if, if Russia will, you know, does, is going to invade or use military force, they're going to use deception efforts. They're going to move stuff around. The stuff they can do to confuse open source reporting and make it more difficult to understand. And so basically my view is, you know, it was it was useful to track uh, until Russia got all the kind of comp power in place they needed for an invasion. One, one, and we, we could, you know, essentially track that. The number of BGs arriving, where those units were. Once that stuff had arrived, once it was in an alert status, right, in staging points, that was as far as OSINT goes, because then it's like, you know what? We can't observe the final things. It's, it's in place they want to go. There's a window in which they can do this. And that's as kind of much as you can tell without being certain beyond that. So it's, it's been useful. But, you know, th- 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 at this point, it's going to be less useful because it's, th- it's there. Russia can escalate an hour's notice. And you, you, won't, you won't necessarily tell from open sources when those kind of things or signals are sent. Right. No, that makes sense. So what do we think it's going to look like? You know, one of the things that I think the Russians, you know, I, I asked that question as a prelude because one of the things is that you can see a lot of the buildup, but you can't divine intent. You can a little bit by judging the size and scope, right? So let me caveat there. But I think that, you know, depending on, let's say, how far the Russians want to push into Ukraine is really up to the Russian leadership. So how do we think this is going to go? Look, I agree with you that the problem with a very large military posture is you can infinitely generate potential operations from it, and that's not the right analytical approach. That's not the way to think about it, because what you end up is a long list of what's possible for the adversary, right? And grocery lists, to me, are not good forms of analysis. So to me, the first question is, what are the political objectives that Russia will likely try to achieve? The, use, the point of use of force is political ends. What are the likely political ends that they will pursue? I made an argument that, yes, this force posture makes limited war aims and limited operations of various stripes possible, but that's not that's not what we should focus on. And here I have some nuanced, uh, maybe we'll go now some of small differences with, with Rob's uh, take, but I'll be curious to hear what, what, what he's got to say on the subject. And that is, I basically see a fairly maximal scenario. And the reason why is that it is widely acknowledged I mean, publicly in Russia that previous campaigns of limited use of force to compel Ukraine to sign Minsk agreements have failed. In fact, that is what has brought us to this point. There's no point to repeating the types of operations we saw in 2014 and 2015. And there's a huge problem that Moscow has had in enforcing their preferences. That is, they can compel through force Ukraine to sign anything, right, at at gunpoint. But it's not actually led to the implementation or the political, to the attainment of political objectives that Russia saw, right? And they understand that Whatever operation they conduct, as soon as they withdraw, their leverage is gone, right? That that the whole thing could then fall apart. It could, um, any local developments they see could stall out. So my view is that what we're actually going to see is a military operation, which is a multi-axis attack into Ukraine. It's likely going to start with an air campaign, but I don't think the air campaign is going to be very long. And we're going to see uh, fairly large uh, incursions by combined arms maneuver formations with a pincer movement to Kiev and encirclement of the capital. 
a simultaneous large envelopment of Ukrainian forces in the southeastern part of the country along the line of contact in the Donbass, which will include a um, fairly large movement of Russian forces from Belgorod past Kharkov and also from the Kursk region past Sumy. And you're going to have as well a very likely axis of attack coming out of Crimea to cut off the ground lines of communication for Ukrainian forces in the eastern part of the country, right? And that the, the point of this operation will be to, to be able to install a pro-Russian government in the capital. And you say, how are they going to do that? They don't. They clearly don't plan on, on very substantial amounts of urban warfare. And the reason for that is they, they are posturing as though they have an inside political track. There's another shoe here to drop that we don't know about, which is they have likely pre-cooked a, a transition government with a host of pro-Russian elites in the capital. And people just assume that that's the case, that there's a political side to this game that we can't see. And most likely, once they encircle the capital, they expect they'll be able to cut deals with regional elites in cities like Kharkov and not have to fight for them. Um, when, when we got to look at other aspects of force posture, all right, they have follow-on forces to hold territory, auxiliary forces like Rose Guardian and the like. And they're dragging a lot of equipment that suggests they, they will be holding terrain. I personally assume that beyond seizing uh, regions of Ukraine east of uh, Dnieper River and the capital, they're likely to pursue a campaign along the southern southwestern coast towards Odessa. All right, so I don't know how far west they're going to go. I think the biggest uh, decision that they're going to make is how far west of the river they're going to operate um, and where they're going to potentially uh, uh, stop this campaign. But a, I, I don't see another way to make use of force worthwhile for Russia because any limited use of force, Aaron, is going to come with tremendous sanctions in the program, right? You're sort of, uh, you know, the in for a penny, in for a pound uh, old adage, right? If, if any incursion to make it worthwhile for them is going to, it's already going to have immense cost. For a second, the Ukrainian military is just strong enough to resist a limited campaign. A limited campaign would have indeterminate outcomes and actually fairly high casualties, right? The only way the Russian military can do this fast and decisively is maximum use of force, right? Overwhelming use of force fairly quickly because the Ukrainian military today is not what it was in 2015. The Russian military isn't either. It's actually in incredibly uh, transformed in terms of quality and the size of the force structure compared to what it was in 2015. But nonetheless, Ukraine has a strong enough military to resist a very small operation like the kind we saw in the winter of 2015. That's one of the many reasons why it's very unlikely. You're never going to see the local leaders pull the trigger on something that's indeterminate and could have high casualties when they actually have the force, the, the military instrument at hand to, to do it decisively, to do it on a large scale, and probably to do it fairly quickly. Um, so, so with that, I, I, this is where I have a minor difference with some of those who argue, okay, that this is gonna be a components campaign. I don't believe they're going to compel Ukraine to sign anything. I believe they actually will conduct regime change. They will go to the capital and they're going to install, try and install a government that suits Russian preferences. And to some extent, some amount of Russian forces will stick around, although they're clearly banking on the majority of forces used to stabilize the situation being Ukrainian forces themselves, right? But some transitional or interim government, revised constitution, whatnot, the Ukrainian security forces will ultimately comply after this. But anyway, I'd be curious to hear, you know, uh, Rob thoughts on this and, and, and what his take is looking at, at the same force posture. Take a step back first. So I think one of the big, you know, the big, big couple of big questions about was what Russia's doing. And one of the big ones, and, and this is where I think Mike and I deviate from some of the other people who look at this, who are, who are quite good Russia watchers, is um, if you look at the previous times Russia used military force under Putin, um, if they use force now, it would deviate from that pattern. Because every other time there was a time sensitive external catalyst that had that they basically led them to react to a situation, and that's why you, they used military force the way they did, right? So, you know, in 2015, Assad regime by the fall, obviously the Maidan in 2014, 2008, you know, Georgia tried to, to, to take re, retake of South Ossetia, you know, despite where Russia doing, you know, plenty of course of things. Um, and so, you know, I think I think when people look at the timing of the operation, this time would be different because, because it isn't mm -hmm. as obvious there is a time-sensitive thing that is forcing the agenda, right? So I think with a lot of people, a lot of arguments about why people thought an invasion was unlikely, they looked at previous, you know, use of force and said, OK, this doesn't really fit right now. The concern that I've had really, I think this, this is fall, is that Russian behavior has changed. 
right? And basically, they, they, and they, and they signal it. So they, they did build them a spring. And then you look at the events of the summer, and they said basically, okay, enough of this, right? We're, we're not dealing with this anymore. And they, they, they were, you know, making it very clear this fall. They were real, willing to use force if necessary, and they were willing to, to pursue certain political objectives. So Mike is right. If, 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 they, if they go into Ukraine, the costs are going to be high, no matter what. And so that, you know, when, in my article, I laid out different kind of military options. And one of the things that I came, you know, concluded was basically the lower military options don't make much sense because there will be costs. And basically, the question is, what objectives do you really achieve? Right. So some some people, you know, and they're in their list of kind of COAs they mentioned, they talk about occupying different parts of Ukraine. And, and the, the the problem is Russia doesn't necessarily want to just occupy parts of Ukraine for the sake of occupying. Right. They could have done that any time last seven years. So you hear this idea about land bridge and other things. It's always it's, it's never made much sense by itself. And so the purpose is that the, they, they see Ukraine as a problem right now and it is a it is unacceptable status quo. And so they want to change you know, in some way keeps political orientation, you know, and they're willing to do it by force, right? And, and that could be done in different ways, and it could mean different things, right? It could have meant implementing Minsk and saying, okay, you, there are certain red lines, you, you know, domestic red lines of things you, you're, gonna, you're not going to do because it, it's a red line for us, right? You know, different, like, language laws and other things in Ukraine. Ukraine has kept pushing those boundaries of what Russia thinks is okay. And, and again, Russian, Russian officials – all these steps over the last year, when, when the steps against Medvedchuk of the language law, Russian officials have come out and used really heavy rhetoric in response. They've been very clear about this. Um, so it, it, you can chronologically track this. So when we look at this, you know, it, it, Mike is right about this. It's, it's about how, do we, how does Russia tie um, you know, the transit military force into achieving political goals? And, it, and, it's, and it's an open question. And my view was when we look at Russia's previous use of military force, it depends how much it's going to deviate. And so Mike is saying it thinks it's more likely you might have an occupation, which would, which means it deviates substantially, it's really substantially from previous uses of force. The Crimea is a bit of an outlier, so I, I think we, we should leave that to a side. But, you know, Georgia, um, you know, Donbass, complete deviation. Um, I my, my view is that the more likely scenario was that you'd see a Georgia plus, where it'd be a lot more force, a really heavy use of, of you know, compellence against the Ukrainian military, inflicting pain, destroying military units, taking POWs, um, degrading defensive capabilities to defend in the future, and maybe that might be enough. And my view at the end was basically, if that's not enough, right, by, by just um, that amount of force, then then maybe it becomes, okay, last resort is regime change, occupying parts of Kyiv, what have you, right? And obviously, you look at Russia's force disposition, but it, you know, ever since October, when, when Russia started moving the 41st Combined Arms Army Equipment, that was based in Poganova. They moved that to Yelnya. Wasn't clear to me why they're doing that. And then we obviously found out, well, they're deploying 1st Tank Army stuff to Poganova. And then, you know, when, when you compare that to spring, where almost all the reinforcements were in Crimea, this time, it was all, you know, most of the reinforcements, the new stuff coming in, was in Ukraine's north and northeastern border. It tells you something about intentions, because that's, that's, that gets you close to Kiev, and it's not far. And so that becomes an option, at a minimum, that they go to Kiev, or at least try and threaten it. Ultimately, my view was that um, they, they would try kind of compellence first, and then maybe the kind of more more ambitious options. And my view of that is because I think that if, if Russian force go in the cities, right, you you, you make it um, you limit some of the Russian military's advantages over the Ukrainian military. Right, huge advantage in fires, ISR, other capabilities. They have a lot of standoff weapons. If they fight, you know, outside cities, the Ukrainian military really can't stand up against that. If you go in cities, right, and the Ukrainian military decides to fall back in cities, that's when javelins become useful, in-laws become useful, other things like that become useful. Um, it, also, if you go in cities, it means civ civilian casualties are going to go up, right? It's, it's going to happen. Civilians are going to, cities are going to, you know, you risk cities are going to get destroyed, a lot of damage. To me, my view of, of Russian you know, domestic approval was that it wasn't too much of a restraint for Russia in terms of an operation in Ukraine, but if large number of Ukrainian civilians started getting killed, that, that could have been a thing that would be a, an issue for, for Putin. That was my view. It's, it remains to be seen how that will happen. But basically, when I was trying to look at it, um, you know, I, I thought going to cities makes things much more difficult, more complex, more unpredictable for Russia. It's still an open question to me how that will work if they do it. Um, but absolutely, the, the final resort is there, right? If, if they don't achieve their aims through more limited use of force, then it means more substantial kind of option is, is necessary. The big thing that's been clear this whole year 
is that Putin has been signaling since, I think, you know, when we decided to do this build up in October and November, he's been signaling, I think, all along that ultimately, depending how events go, if we don't get these kind of concessions we're demanding, military force is going to be the resort, right? We're, we have a last resort. We're willing to use it. And ultimately, when we look at military force, if they if they go into Ukraine, they're willing to go um, much more, much farther and try to pursue much more ambitious political objectives than you normally expect them to. But again, this is a deliberate campaign, right? This isn't a reaction. It is a deliberate campaign. They've thought through this. They've had time to think through this, prepare it, everything else. And so all that, and again, you know, the the development of this new reserve system called BARS, which is where they have, you know, contract servicemen, which, you know, before most reservists are conscripts, right? So they're not, they're not well-trained and they're not useful for really anything. This is much more like a NATO military volunteer service where it's volunteers, they sign up, and they're also supposed to be able to, you know, p- potentially be deployed beyond the borders because of contracts orders, not conscripts. Well, you know, it, it, the first time I heard about BARS was August, and at, I was a surprise. And it was very clear it was a rushed program. They tried to raise the numbers very quickly. And it's very clear from some of the public reporting that that's what was concerning to the intelligence community is, that, you know, wh- what what good reason is there to very quickly try and form a, you know, contract service, reservist kind of force, right? It, it's, it's to create bodies, and why would you need that? Well, you know, there's an obvious reason. It's a very concerning one. So all of those things together, right, point a very concerning, you know, in a very concerning uh, direction. And that's even without seeing, I, I don't have any, you know, access to intelligence. I have no doubt there's stuff the, the IC is seeing that I'm not seeing that is really concerning. That's why their confidence level is so high. But even the public stuff, right, it's, it's very obvious. Rhetoric has changed. Russian behavior has changed. And, you know, you know, a lot of the people that I've talked to in Russia as well, you know, the, some of them don't think, didn't think an invasion was imminent, but a lot of them said it's going to happen at some point, right? We're, we're on a trajectory here where something's going to give because Russia says status quo is not acceptable and we're not going to keep allowing it. And Ukraine keeps going, taking policies that Russia says is not acceptable. And so ultimately, you know, military force becomes that kind of last option. And, you know, th- that that's my kind of view. And, and, sorry, when I say limited, limited use of force, I'm not saying that as in this is not going to be bloody. I'm saying a massive use of fires right? A, a ground campaign that would still be designed to destroy units and foot casualties. You know, even, even the most kind of minimal kind of op, you know, options I'm looking at, it'd still be thousands of Ukrainian casualties, that tens of thousands, right? It would be a significant, terrible, terrible thing. And what really concerns me is that I don't think people understand how, how lethal and fast modern warfare is. It's very, it's very fast. It's very lethal because every time we fight it, it's, it's a very kind of narrowly focused way with you know, heavy ROEs, so on things. If Russia decides to unleash their MLRS fires with cluster munitions and so on, they'd blank the entire grid squares kilometer by kilometer with cluster munitions and kill everything in that, right? They want to do that. They can do that. And I think that's something they might do. And, you know, the first 30, 40 minutes of this conflict, you know, we could see a tremendous amount of damage done to Ukraine military, um, knocking out airfields, knocking out bridges, knocking out air defense systems. Russia has that fires capability right in the first 30 minutes to do a tremendous amount of damage. And, you know, I I think it's really concerning what's going to happen. Yeah, I think we all do. Um, I know that the major U.S. concern will be spillage. Will this spill out the potential? Nu- uh, I'm about to say nuclear. I may be Freudian slip. Potential spillage out in the NATO um, countries that are also along uh, the border with Russia. Yeah, yeah, I'll try to kind of add to Rob's thoughts. So I think one of the biggest unknown questions here is to what extent we're going to get urban warfare, and that's actually a political decision on both sides. Ukrainians have to choose to defend that way, and it's not it's not clear what they will choose to do. I've heard a lot of stories from Ukraine of how Ukrainian forces will just break up into partisan groups and things of that nature. I have to tell you, those are things people say that sound really neat on paper. If you're a mechanized uh, infantry battalion and you've never trained in a small group partisan warfare, that's not a thing you can just do. Okay, there's all sorts of things that have to do with command and control organization logistics. So it's the kind of thing that notionally sounds very easy. But if you've actually never done that and you're organized as a conventional maneuver force, you're not necessarily going to be able to just do those things, right? And um, when it comes to, you know, urban warfare, I, I to me, I, I, I think we're going to, we have to first see how the initial part of the campaign plays out. Russia has a tremendous amount of fires. As you know, it's an artillery army with lots of tanks. It's a very fires heavy military that uses firepower decisively in an exploitable maneuver. But the Russian military does not have a tremendous amount of precision guided weapons, and it's going to keep a whole bunch of them in reserve as always, for a regional or large-scale war with NATO. There's some percentage that they're going to have always set aside for a large-scale war, especially if this thing escalates, which you asked. So they're going to be using them judiciously. You're going to see a lot of unguided weapons being employed. And another factor, 
uh, Russian Air Force is pretty, Russian Air Space Force are pretty terrible at close air support. They usually use yeah. unguided weapons for that, and they leave that role to helicopters, to the rotor aviation wing. So there's a lot of unguided munitions that are likely to be used here, and their early precision fires campaign is likely to be limited relative to the tremendous amount of indirect fires they'll bring to the battlefield. Um, on your big question, well, you sort of, you dropped the N-word, good timing. You know, Russia delayed its uh, annual nuclear forces exercise groom to literally this week. And that is obviously yeah. no co no coincidence. If you, you know, if you think this is a coincidence, then I, I could probably sell you anything at this point. That um, <laughs> they've delayed intentionally as part of uh, Russian strategic deterrence measures, deterrence by intimidation or what they call fear inducement to make clear to the United States and NATO that there's a real risk of escalation to include nuclear, uh, nuclear employment in the event that U.S. NATO tried to interfere in the Russian military operation in Ukraine. That's very obviously the posturing they're engaged in. On escalation beyond this conflict, listen, I, I, I have to tell you, the, the, the worst case scenario here is not um, just what happens in Ukraine. The worst case scenario here is the following crisis, right? If we have strategic sanctions against Russia, Russia retaliates, we start with cyber warfare, it's going to very likely escalate into a security crisis between Russia and NATO as a follow-on crisis months from now, right? If we think how this thing plays out three to six months from now, put whatever happens in Ukraine to the side for the moment, there are real consequences. Right now, both sides are trying to localize the conflict and contain it, right? To try to keep it from becoming a regional conflict. That's natural, and, and you can see that. You have a lot of force-on-force -force interactions right now between NATO, NATO forces and theirs, because you have so many operations taking place in the air and at sea uh, in close proximity. But how this escalates down the line to me is one of the biggest considerations. And it's not clear where Russian forces will stop. The refugee crisis that they will unleash result in front of us is going to have direct stability implications for Poland and other countries, right? The U.S. is going to try to coordinate uh, the policies of uh, neighboring states so that they don't go gunslinging on their own because they're scared for their own security. So Poland and other countries don't think that maybe it's a good idea to try to attain their own security and counter intervene, right? Because you know, they're going to pursue their national interests. We don't tell these countries what to do, right? You know, you've seen how wars in Europe quickly unfold. Before you know it, countries, you get a spiral decision-making model, countries start making what they think are good decisions for themselves, and they end up taking taking what is a, a localized conflict into a regional war. Um, so I think these are all the challenges we face, even just beyond the situation in Ukraine. The, the threat of escalation is real, and I'm really concerned just you know, how we in Europeans retaliate, how we punish Russia for doing this, and how then Russia answers that punishment with their own forms of retaliation, and the road that takes us down uh, three to six months from now, that's kind of foremost in my mind. Yep, same. Um, it's not good. Rob? Yeah, so, so you know, aside from Grom, one of the things we see in Russian de de deployments is they deployed a, a bunch of systems that are clearly designed to deter NATO, right, and, and, and a bunch of conventional things. So, Right now, they deployed um, MiG-31Ks with Kinjal missiles to Syria. They also deployed four TU-22M3 bombers with KH-22 cruise missiles. Pretty clear sign. Big big naval deployments, naval exercises going on the Mediterranean, Pacific, elsewhere. Again, and also the Barents Sea, another sign that Russia can, you know, responds, can make life difficult for NATO elsewhere beyond Europe, but in other, air, other regions if NATO decides to get involved in Ukraine. The deployment S-400s, S-235s, other things to Belarus. I think a lot of that is to help defend Kaliningrad if they need to defend Kaliningrad. They also put a MiG-31K with Kinjal to Kaliningrad, something that has happened before. That puts, you know, London, Paris, Rome, all in, all in range if necessary. Um, so they, they're doing a lot of things to not just increase their posture in Ukraine, but in general where, where NATO is, right? So that means pulling everything away from the Eastern Middle District. I mean, right now, so, someone, someone estimated that basically Russia has the fewest forces near the border of China they had since the 1920s, right? Just to show you, and again, and also broader question about their, their their perception of threats and you know whether or not we can pull them away from China, what have you. Pretty clear that they're they're making that very clear what they're doing right now. Wars are unpredictable, and and, and Putin knows this. Right? I mean, he knows this better than probably anyone because he's let, he's been in charge of you know so many conflicts as leader. Um, it, it it really it's hard to say what will happen. Right? Once something kicks off, you know, different countries make decisions, things escalate. It's impossible to predict how things go. It's a very it's a very dangerous situation. And, you know, if, if we do see lots of refugees, that becomes a huge issue for NATO, for the EU. I mean, it, it, it will be it could be a momentous kind of strategic um, event in global politics because, you know, Russia and China will likely become closer. That affects other countries like India and, and you know, non-European countries. I don't know. It's it's too many things to kind of kind of predict. But ultimately, it's, it's a huge right. It's, it's a really dangerous moment 
and it potentially is going to kick off in the next few days. Right. And so, I mean, again, this is one of the most dangerous moments in, in I think, European history. Um, I don't know when the last time it's been this dangerous, uh, arguably maybe the 80s. But the situation is really, really concerning. And this, this is, you know, is very, very likely this could be the you know, largest conventional war in Europe since, you know, also the Cold War um, or, or, you know, going back before then. Right. World War Two. The signs right now are, are not good. And you know, there isn't an obvious kind of de- de-escalation step here. Right. And there hasn't been. And I think that's, that's been why Mike and I've been so pessimistic for a while. Since Russia made the demands in December, right, it hasn't been an obvious off ramp because ultimately Russia wants to say in Ukraine in, in affairs, it's not something NATO can bequeath, right? It's not just NATO saying Ukraine won't join NATO, it's more than that. And there are more things, more red lines Russia has made clear that involve things that can be done in Ukraine. So NATO is in a position to, you know, to make these concessions by itself. Um, and then in Ukraine, it, it politically isn't popular to do so, right? And again, you know, part this is, this is part of a crisis that is of Russia's making. By removing the, you know, the, the vote, the areas of Ukraine that are most kind of, you know, anti-NATO or not supportive of NATO and the kind of most supportive of Russia in general, you, you forever change the electoral nature of Ukraine and you make it more likely the politics that they're going to take are going to be, you know, more antagonistic to Russia's positions. Well, that's the situation we're in now. And, you know, again, that's that's why they're, they're threatening force now. And yeah, it's unfortunately, I, I don't know. I don't have a good prediction of how things will go after the starts, but um, you know, it can go in a lot of really bad ways and it's, it'd be hard to predict what will happen. Yeah. You know, that's ultimately my concern. I mean, obviously, outside the narrow immediate scope of war in Ukraine, it's the spillage argument. And I think people are underestimating the risk of sort of uh, the escalatory spirals, at least decision making spirals that come from expected U.S. and Western coercive punishment for Russia after it decides to undertake its invasion. With that, we've been talking for 53 minutes. Um, I want to thank both of you guys for doing this. Um, I expect we'll get the band back together again soon, not because of a happy reunion, but just to keep everybody updated about what it is that's going on. Uh, So with that, uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Check out their pieces. They're linked below in the um, show notes. I think both were quite prescient um, in, in how this was going, and we will keep everybody up to date. So with that, thank you very much for listening. Be sure to subscribe to Chain Reaction on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to be notified about new episodes. To explore more from the Foreign Policy Research Institute's research, podcasts, and upcoming events, please visit us on www.fpri.org.